Hey guys, welcome to the Regenerative Health Podcast, episode number seven. Today, I speak with Jenna Poole. She's a functional nutritionist from Albury, New South Wales, Australia, and she uses diet and nutrition to help women with hormonal and gut issues. She's the first of a couple in a series that I'm going to be doing on pregnancy preparation, where we talk about building a power bank of of micronutrients and uh, nutrients to make sure and, and help that the pregnancy goes as smoothly as possible. If you're enjoying my content, please like, comment, subscribe, um, and engage uh, and share the podcast. It it, um, it all helps get the word out. So thank you very much for listening and, and here's the podcast. With Jenna Poole, she's a functional nutritionist. Um, Jenna, thanks for coming onto the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Great. Can you give us a little bit of background about yourself and what you do? Yes, definitely. So I am 32 years old and I have three beautiful babies. Um, And I guess my journey to become a nutritionist started when I was 16. I developed a chronic pain disorder called fibromyalgia. And then through that, depression, anxiety, and a wicked eating disorder. So I had from the age of 12 just this morphed body image of what I looked like and it really fed this disordered eating behavior and so because of the fiber in my algebra, it was really debilitating um, I was popped on some medication to help with that and it really did help but it kind of only helped to a certain extent um, and then when I finished up school I went overseas to travel Europe and I realized that I I've always been conscious of food. Like I've always been conscious of what it is, like margarine versus butter. Butter is a real food, whereas margarine is made in a factory. And so when I was overseas, I was consuming like vibrant vegetables and I was trying to make the best choices possible. And I noticed that I had a really positive outlook on where we were and I was enjoying myself and I was having fun. And then I looked at the people I was traveling with who were consuming really fast food, heavy density stuff that was just not real food and they were pessimistic they were lethargic they just kind of like were sludging on through their trip and it made me wonder like what's the difference here why am I feeling so positive and excited and they're feeling really like pessimistic and the only thing that I could think of was the food and so after my travels when I came back home I started diving into nutrition and what it did for your body and the different types of nutrients. Like I remember researching lemons and their um, vitamin C content. And over this process of eating real food, I slowly started to unwind my anxiety and I, my bloating removed, like went away and my digestion got better and my acne, which was there for years all of a sudden went away within two weeks of trying different nutritional principles and so I yeah I just went on this journey of eating real food looking into the next step whether it was soaking my vegetables to remove the pesticide content or whether it was buying organic produce where I could and um, my acne went away my cycle went from a 60-day cycle to a 30-day regular cycle it went from being incredibly painful where I want to vomit to no symptoms at all which has stayed after three pregnancies as well and so it was just this evolution of watching my body go from debilitated and living with pain to thriving and what I really noticed the difference with that is that when I was in pain and I wasn't feeling good in my body I wasn't living my life and that was devastating to me because People tell you that in your early 20s, that's the time to thrive. And I wasn't thriving. I wasn't enjoying it. I was anxious. I was depressed. I didn't feel good. And so I wasn't able to live that full life that I thought I should be living. And so it's exciting to me today to be able to say that I'm definitely thriving and I feel incredible in my body. And I went through... um, university and did a bachelor of science and majored in nutritional medicine so looking at a food as medicine approach to healing the body and supporting the body through illness and I use that today to help other people do the same yeah fantastic and 
that concept of thriving versus just surviving is one that I really, really like. Um, and I think it's a question that people need to ask themselves um, and turn the mirror on themselves and say, to ask, am I just getting by or am I truly thriving? And I, am I feeling good? Am I waking up with energy? Am I looking forward to the day? Am I not, I'm not napping or feeling tired throughout the day. And and I think people should just keep coming back to that question and keep that in mind and and think about their lifestyle and their diet and and really keep that as a um as a as a focal point and a question to ask. Um so that's that's amazing. And you as you mentioned, you've had three pregnancies, you had uh, an experience with irregular uh, painful periods that have that have since resolved. So I guess that's brought you to what I believe is your main patient um, group or your ma- main treatment um, population, which is um, young women. So can you talk a little bit about who you see and what kind of services you're offering to um, to those clients? Absolutely. So, yeah, I definitely see mainly women around their hormonal and gut issues. So I call it gut health and hormonal wealth. So, you know, leaning into that concept of thriving. And now also we tie into that, this relationship with food, but also relationship with yourself. So throughout this disordered eating pattern and these hormonal issues that I had, I really realized that your relationship with food is directly a relation, is is representative of the relationship that you have with yourself. And so you cannot separate your hormonal well-being and your gut well-being from your emotional well-being. You just, from your psyche, you just simply cannot do that. And a supervisor at uni said to me, weight loss is never about weight loss. And I think that carries through to everything. And so with the people that I see in front of me, often they've gone through many other people and they're coming to me and they're saying my periods are not regular or I've got fibromyalgia and it's not improving and I've only gotten so far with my gut health. Like what's the next step? And it's really about looking at them typically have been eaten a conventional diet and not understanding what real food is, but also not understanding how good that they can feel. And so my main demographic of people that I do see in my clinic is women who are looking to optimize their health pre-pregnancy in order to prepare for a baby. And you know what? Sometimes that looks like five to seven years before they're ready. Sometimes that looks like when they don't even have a partner. Um, But they're aware that the way that their body is functioning now is not an optimal state for their body to hold a baby and to grow a baby and to birth a baby. And, um, I mean, I am very fortunate that I've had three pregnancies and three births and three very healthy children. Not to say that all of those didn't have challenges, but I think that there's like when you when a client comes to see me, there's two two components that can benefit them. And one of them is that I have a practitioner, uh, educated Bachelor of Science background in terms of what's going to help them. But I also have this experiential point of view where I have been through what they're wanting to go through, which is super cool. And so depending on the client, I use a very individualized food as medicine and nutrient as medicine approach. So that involves things like looking at their diet and optimizing their diet along with supplements and nutritional principles. Um, but also functional testing, which is so cool because if your hormone cycle is out of whack, if you have been on the contraceptive pill for 10 years plus, then we don't know where your cycle is. And your cycle isn't just a um, a sign of whether or not you can get pregnant. It's a sign of fertility. And fertility isn't just whether or not you can get pregnant. Fertility is your vibrancy. It's your vitality. It's your energy. It's your zest for life. It's the cycles within you that mimic a, you know, a yearly season. So we have that within us. And I think if we can get people back to that space of thriving within their cycles and understanding they don't have to be the same every single day, that you're a cyclical being and that we can help you thrive within each season of life and season of your cycle, then um, they're much more empowered beings. Hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, oh, sorry, go yeah. on. I was just going to say in the functional testing component is that if you don't know where your cycle is, if you don't know when you ovulate, if you have a really long cycle, if you've got lots of PMS, so premenstrual symptoms like bloating, achy sore boobs or tender breasts, fluctuations in weight, then we need to, we can use some functional testing 
to um, look at what's going on. Is your estrogen really high? Do you have estrogen dominance? Do you, is your progesterone really low? Where's your testosterone? And it shows us the pathways in which through the body that that goes. So if you were to typically go and get a blood test for your estrogen, it would give you a marker in time. It would say at this time on this day, this is where it's at. Whereas this testing shows us not only your levels, but how it flows through the body, which is your body's pathways, how it's metabolized through the pathways. And then in conjunction, how does that work with things like your other hormones and um, your other um, pictures as well? Yeah, and um, I like this idea and I really want to emphasize the point about a healthy menstrual cycle as an indicator of health because women have this this regular monthly process that is a, a real barometer um, that, that indicates um, how, how, he- how healthy and how fertile they are. And that's not something as men that we have. So um, I feel yeah. like a lot of women these days are disconnected from their, their body and their menstrual cycle, often if they're taking hormonal contraceptives um, or they're not aware of the date of their ovulation, they're aware of their fertile period. Um, and all this this un- understanding or, or misunderstanding is, I guess, feeding into uh, difficulty down the line when it comes to wanting to have children because you, you're not aware of, of that, that regular process. You're not in touch with it. Um, and by taking medications that completely dull down or turn off your uh, fertile uh, a period or your, your hormonal um, cycling, then, mm. yeah, there's, there's that real disconnect. So um, t- t- tell me a little bit or talk about how nutrients, particularly nutrients in the diet, affect that, that fertile cycle and the menstrual cycle and how what nutrients at what times can help women start having more painless um, uh, menstrual cycles. I absolutely love this question because I take a different approach in terms of first we look at what can you not do, you know? So rather than what can we can we do, what can we remove? Because often PMS, premenstrual symptoms and irregularities in your hormone cycle, often they are due to an inflammatory diet. So pain is often a result of inflammation. Yeah, so we're looking at gut microbiome along with your hormones because your the food that you eat impacts your gut, but also your gut is the one that absorbs and breaks down the food to then absorb the nutrients. And so if your gut isn't happy and it's inflamed and it's clunky and it's leaky and it's not absorbing all of your beautiful nutrients, then that's going to directly have a flow and effect to your monthly cycle. So often I look at what are you eating? And what can we remove so or, or swap out for? So, for example, seed oils. Seed oils are the number one thing that we look at with inflammation because seed and, and uh, they directly impact inflammation within your gut. They also have been shown to denature your DNA, so the way that that repl- replicates. You feel awful on them, but often you don't realize how good you can feel. So you're kind of just like chugging through going like, well, I got a bit of a headache and I'm a little bit bloated and I'm a little bit tired and I'm not sleeping well, but everything is just like a little bit. It's not like a massive symptom that is causing you to go straight to a practitioner to get help. It's just all these little underlying things. And so if you're consuming these foods, well, I call them like fake foods (laughs) that aren't real, then your body doesn't know what to do with them. So the body sees it as a toxin and what does it do with a toxin? If it can't metabolize it and break and that means break it down and excrete it through your digestive system, your sweat and your breath, then what happens is it'll shove it into a fat cell because a fat, fat is very protective. So the toxins, it's sitting in there quite happily with the fat around it. It's not going to cause any damage to the body. So typically I'm looking at what are you eating that we can remove in terms of seed oils, refined carbohydrates, sugar, what's your alcohol intake like, um, and what what are the levels of micronutrients within your diet. And what happens when you do consume a highly refined diet and with lots of um, fake foods or food-like products is that it crowds out the opportunity to eat micronutrient-dense foods. 
Okay, so that's things like your green leafy vegetables that contain your calcium, your vitamin K, your vitamin E, your magnesium, which I really want to talk about in regards to cycles and PMS because it's the biggest one that comes up in terms of deficiency and also iron. Yeah, so when you're regularly bleeding, you are depleting your iron levels and then if they're out of whack, you may not be able to, or your diet isn't right, you may not be able to replenish them. So there's that side of things, but then the biggest, the biggest, the biggest factor of your cycle being out of whack actually has nothing to do with food, typically. It comes to do with something called your HPA axis, yeah, which is your, I call it your hippopotamus (laughs) or your hypothalamus, your pituitary and your adrenal pathway, yes? So this pathway is our stress pathway. And what tends to happen is that above my head, this is all of the environmental stresses and factors that I move about in my daily life. And they are all filtered through the hippopotamus or the hypothalamus. The um, hypothalamus then sends information to the pituitary gland to then kind of send, I'm just, I'm just making this real easy for people to understand, to then send nutrients to either your adrenals, your thyroid, or your reproductive hormones, your your sex hormones. So that's your ovaries and your testes, or your organs, sorry. Okay, so if you are, if we look at those three pathways, which is the hypothalamus, pituitary, reproductive, the thyroid, and then the adrenal pathway, your adrenal pathway will always be prioritized because, and this is your stress pathway, because that's what keeps us alive, yes? So if, for example, you are chronically stressed, and that could look like on a primal setting, I love primal settings, being chased by a tiger continuously. If you're being chased by a tiger continuously, the question then is, is it a good time to make a baby? Does your body feel safe to bring a baby into the world when you are constantly being chased by a tiger? No, because if it would likely die, the tiger would get the baby. Um, they have mozzies everywhere. So... Typically what then does is the body can shut off that reproductive pathway, that leg of that HBA system, okay? So this is where people can, women can lose their periods completely because they are so stressed and they're using all of their nutrients for this HBA axis pathway that they don't have the nutrient density or the capacity or the space to be feeding this reproductive pathway as well. So the reproductive leg is the one that first goes and then we see issues with the thyroid because your thyroid is involved in things like metabolism. And metabolism means the rate at which cells turn over. So it's not just how hungry you get. It's things like your hair growth. It's things like your digestion. It's things like your energy, your skin health, your vibrancy, your sleep, your heart rate. So we tend to see fluctuations in that second or at the same time. But the HPA axis, your stress pathway, will always be prioritized because it keeps you alive. So we address the diet and we need to address the stress because if you are chronically stressed, you will be utilizing more nutrients than you are getting in from your diet. And that's what I call a higher requirement. Yeah, no, um, that's, um, that's a very interesting perspective. And yeah, for sure. I mean, cortisol production is prioritized over um, sex hormones. Yeah, as you were saying, it, um, the precursors get diverted towards um, yeah, the, the stress response, and that totally makes sense evolutionarily. You don't want to be um, expending energy and, and nutrients on reproductive functions when you have a, a more acute and a more pressing um, survival need. So that, that that's fascinating. Yeah. So so you address both the nutritional and the stress component components to um, having a healthy um, and period. So. Let, let's like take that then to this idea of pregnancy preparation. And to me, it makes sense that before attempting to fall pregnant, you want to be cycling six months, maybe one, at least a year of regular painless um, menstrual cycles that are predictable. Um, is, is that something that you think about or uh, strive towards? Yeah, definitely. I think it's a minimum six months that you want to like look at preparing you want to look at good six months of really committing to optimal health whatever that looks like for you and looking at your gut microbiome as well and this is why you can never just look at one thing um but if you i guess i guess the other that the, the biggest part of this is um if you don't know what's going on in your cycle you don't know when to 
press go on making a baby, right? <laughs> so typically, and this this is very it's, it's fascinating to me. You're, you will ovulate and then exactly 14 days later you will get your period. But pe- women ovulate at all different days of their cycle. So typically we see it maybe around the 19 to 21 days, but some people ovulate earlier than that. And so if you're not in touch with your cycle, and that means your body, that means your body. What is going on in your body and your bodily functions? What does your mucus look like? Um, how stretchy is it? How watery is it? If it's powdery, then we need to do some work in your gut microbiome. So looking at the consistency of your mucus, getting um, women really connecting into their body, their reproductive cycles, the symptoms and the signs that they're experiencing throughout that monthly period is so integral. And, in, and also educate, educating on how to make a baby, right? And I, I did hear once that a woman thought that you ovulated and then one week later you try for a baby. And this isn't any fault of this woman. It's literally that we are not educated. We spend our whole lives avoiding our cycle because we're on the contraceptive pill or we don't want to get pregnant. So we just completely avoid it. And then as soon as we want to get pregnant, all of a sudden we have to figure out what's going on. And so if you decide that in a month's time you want a baby, but you have no idea when you ovulate, if you're healthy enough to ovulate, if you what's going on, then you're going to be throwing stuff at a wall hoping that it sticks. Whereas if you've got six to 12 months of, yes, I'm feeling cyclical, I know my what my discharge, my mucus looks like, I know what that's doing, I know when I'm going to ovulate, I know the last the lifespan of sperm, yeah, which is really important, so it takes two to tango, and then when you get your period and that, that feels really good and you're feeling energy and vital, then you're going to have a lot more, um, you're going to feel a lot more empowered to create a baby, and that's what it's about. It's about feeling empowered, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's self-knowledge. It's self-knowledge yeah. in from a biological point of view. Um, what Socrates said, know thyself. And obviously that's a pretty philosophical, philosophical statement, but it is so relevant to our own bodies and knowing our own bodies, um, and particularly for women and when we're talking about pregnancy, knowing the ins and out of your, outs of your cycle, exactly when you're ovulating. When is that cervical mucus becoming um, the right consistency to facilitate passage of sperm so um yeah i mean great i I really like that that approach and and it's an empowering approach it's it's one of um you know instead of take this pill don't worry about your period you know don't worry about your fertility you can't get pregnant um that's that that's kind of paradigm to hang on know what what's going on know your cycle know your body be empowered and know, know your fertility and use that information to either avoid pregnancy or become pregnant if that's what you want so um yeah. that's fantastic and, and previously we talked and you mentioned this concept of a micronutrient power bank and I, I want you to explain that concept um as it pertains to getting ready to uh to have a baby i love this so much so i guess the first component of that is that whenever i have someone in front of me a client i really encourage them to look at their body like a massive recipe book And whatever recipe you want to create, whether it's a baby or good sleep or good mental health or good digestion, it is possible. Your body knows exactly how to bake that recipe and make that happen. All we need to do is give you the right ingredients and the right tools so that your body can do that. Yeah, it has this innate knowing that we have like only a small portion of understanding of. And so having trust and faith in that is just so important. And when you're ready, when you're getting ready to have a baby, that recipe book needs a really rich and wealthy bank. And so your body is this big bank and you want to have a heap of nutrients in there. You want to be wealthy. You want your diet to be continuously filling up this bank of nutrients because what happens when you get pregnant is that that baby can take you for everything that you've got. (laughs) I know, I've had three of them. Um, and but essentially your body won't just be feeding you your body will be feeding and growing this baby and that takes an immense amount of nutrients and I really want to highlight here that I haven't said calories 
I've said nutrients. And that to me is just so important because I would love people to be looking at their plates and saying, what is the nutrient density of this? What is what is on my plate and knowing, again, coming back to being empowered about what is on their plate so that they know that they're filling their bank, their nutrient bank, their power bank up with nutrients. So over the course of growing a baby, you are going to be taking nutrients out of that bank. You want to make sure that you're filling it back up again and also that you've got room to move because over the course of a pregnancy, I mean, everybody knows about iron and typically like I am seeing a lot of iron deficient women at the moment. Um, why is that? You know, why is that? We need to look at a myriad of, ish, of, of reasons why that is and, and is, is it in their food? Is it in their diet? But before you have a baby, understanding that during birth you will lose some blood and after birth for about six weeks, depending, you will also have blood loss that you want to have your iron really not at a really good adequate level so that you've got room to drop. Because if your iron is low or borderline, then during pregnancy it's just going to drop even further and you're going to be chasing your tail. Not to say it can't be done. I have seen and worked with women to increase their iron during pregnancy, but it's just a lot more forward thinking and future pacing to do it before you get pregnant. So if you have any digestive issues, you need to be looking at getting tested for your iron levels and making sure you're healing that gut microbiome and that gut before you get pregnant so that you can maximize the nutrient absorption of the nutrients you're putting on your plate. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I really like that analogy of this micronutrient bank, the power bank. And I'm I'm thinking about, you know, a pow- literal a power bank that you use to charge your iPhone. And just imagine going yes. traveling and um, perhaps you're going touring for the day in a new city and imagine not even checking or making sure that power bank is full before going out for the day. Mm-hmm. Imagine not even looking it's at working. what this, yeah, well, or if it's even working and just, you know, walking out, you know, exploring a city, you know, you're using your your iPhone, you're using your video, you're depleting your battery all day, but you you haven't even checked whether your battery is working or or it has any charge. And I really think that that is what most people and most couples are, are embarking on this massive project, which is having a child without even checking if their, their power bank is full. And as you mentioned earlier, it's this idea that we we don't want just nutrient adequacy. This is a key point. We're not striving for adequacy. We need a surplus. We want a state of such abundance that no matter what nutrient the body needs at a certain time to build a, a critical component of baby, that it's present and it's there and it can be used. It's like walking through a supermarket. I mean, which supermarket would you prefer to walk through? One that has shelves stacked, you know, six deep with each individual product, or, you know, one that's only got one or two scarce products, you know, on the shelves. If you need six yeah. of a certain product to build, you know, whatever baby's mandible, but you, you need vitamin K two, um, you you want you want that shelf to be six deep, so you can take all yeah. of them and put them in your trolley. You don't want to be in a stage where you where you can only afford to take three of those products yeah. off the shelf. So yeah, um, yeah I, I yeah. really love it, and I think that if we can help people understand that concept and understand that they need to charge their power bank, they need to build their power bank before mm. they start this this pregnancy journey. And it's not good enough. Well, they, they're not, not going to get a good as good an outcome if they go in with mere um, idea of adequacy, but they really need to build this mm. surplus. So, so I, I, yeah. I, I want to just talk next about what are the specific foods that help us build the, the most – robust, the fullest micronutrient power bank? Yeah, I, such a good question. And I think we need to come at it at a couple of different layers. And the first layer for me is always you are not what you eat, you are what you eat eats. So it does not matter if you are eating typically what is said to be the most nutrient-dense food, something like offal or liver. If that is full of chemicals, then you're going to be chasing your tail again. Your body is going to be, you want to make less work for the body. This is all about unlayering and pairing back. And so with your food, 
your food is only as good as the soil it was grown in. So you can have kale, but if you have kale that's grown in nutrient-depleted soil, then you're not going to be getting the vitamin K, the calcium and the magnesium that's typically within or known for, that kale is known for. You're not going to be getting that because it's not in the soil. So you're not what you eat, you're what you eat eats. And so this is the first step. And I think at the start of the journey when people are in my office, I'm asking that question, not only what you eat, but where do you get your food from? Do you grow your food? What do you use on your food? Are you using chemicals on your food? And then educating them on what that is doing because if you're eating food that is sprayed with chemical, I just want to I want to I want to talk about this because it's just so important and a lot of I see a lot of mental health stuff in my clinic, which is amazing because there's so much we can do. But when you have so let's let's take the kale. So you've got the kale and it's grown and it's sprayed with chemical. What that chemical is doing, the pesticide and the herbicide, it is acting on the nervous system of the bug to kill it, right? So when you consume that kale, that chemical is then working on your nervous system, but every single time you eat, it works like an antibiotic to the gut. You're taking an antibiotic through your food three times a day, keeping in mind that when you birth a baby, you pass on to your baby your gut microbiome. Yeah, so when it's birthed through the birth canal, you pass your gut health, your microbiome onto the baby. So you want to start first with what is the quality of the food that I'm eating? Is it organic? Is it free of chemicals? And is it so because then your body has less to do? Yeah, and it's feeding a supportive, diverse gut microbiome and it's not impacting your nervous system and your stress response like the latter. Yeah, so that'll be the number one thing. And then when people are getting looking at getting pregnant, it is it's looking at those really typical foods that we don't normally eat. So yes, things like offal, your liver, your oysters, your pate, because they are so rich in nutrients. But again, looking at organic, no chemical, no antibiotic, no vaccine food, yeah? Because what you eat, you're eating what they've eaten. So you don't want to make more work for yourself. Is that making sense? Yeah, no, I, and I agree. And and I really look at it from an evolutionary point of view, which is yes. um, you we shouldn't be ingesting substances or chemicals that weren't present in our evolutionary past and the onus or the burden on proving uh safety or lack of harm lies squarely upon anyone who would say that you know that it's not a big deal and to me yeah. that process of of justifying it is just completely unnecessary and um and com- completely ridiculous you you, you're much, much better off from a common sense point of view to just simply buy food that was raised without the use of, of all these substances. And we know, I mean, we, we know that the, the mechanisms are coming out of, um, of how these um, industrial herbicides and pesticides affect human health. And I had a great podcast with Brian Usher, a uh, regenerative farmer, um, who, and we talked about the effect of glyphosate and how it nukes your, your gut microbiome and it interferes with the shikimate pathway. That allows your, mm. your your gut microbes to metabolize certain um, nutrients. I'm um, looking. That's just one of them, and you can add in paraquat. You can add in atrazine. I mean, the the list just is is enormous. So yeah, avoid yeah. avoiding these um, chemicals and, and antibiotics um, are, are key. Um, so so yeah. you just mentioned a couple of foods that um, are kind of prized from from a nutrient density point of view, and they're the foods that I. Um, strongly support people eat um, at all stages of their life um, and you mentioned offal and you mentioned seafood so so what about these foods makes them so suitable um, for a pre-pregnancy preparation they are just packed with nutrients packed with nutrients if you look at something like a liver it's rich in to, everybody knows about vitamin a in liver yes it's well well renowned for it um, but also your zinc your zinc and your iron so if we look at oysters is oysters are known to be an aphrodisiac yeah to get you ready and ready to party and create a baby and that's due to their zinc content if you look at the at sperm you really want sperm to be rich in zinc yeah so zinc is a massive it's involved in over 300 enzymatic reactions it's an incredible wound healer so we think about preventing things like stretch marks 
Um, it's also really, really important for your neuro pathways in terms of good mental health. Um, but things like oysters and your liver and your offal, they're rich in that zinc, which we don't get anywhere else. The other, um, you can get them in pepitas, like pumpkin seeds and things like that. But we need to be looking not only at where you're going to find zinc, but in what quantity. So if you were to eat an oyster and you were to eat pumpkin seeds, the amount of pumpkin seeds that you would need to eat to get the same amount of zinc that you'd get in an oyster it wouldn't feel good. You would feel quite unwell from doing that. And so I talk about nutrient density. It's like per bite, how much nutrients are within that. So that's the first thing is that they're massively um, rich in zinc, which is going to support your reproductive health um, and your iron and whatnot as well. That's um, that's great. And I, I think well, I, the way I think about um I think guess these these foods is that we're looking for three things. We're looking for nutrient content. We're looking for bioavailability of those nutrients, and we're looking at presence or absence of anti nutrients or uh, phyto yes. phyto toxins that will inhibit the digestion or metabolism of those nutrients. And yeah. something like um, when we're to- talking about the, the optimal foods that fulfill those three criteria, they're animal foods. And, and they are often the whole organism. So the whole oyster, the whole egg, um, the whole egg yolk. The whole egg. The whole animal um, or something, whole like, animal. something like liver. And, I mean, my, my approach, I agree completely. With, with Liver is the most, probably the most nutrient-dense food um, on the planet. And it has the complete range of B vitamins. It's got um, massive amounts of riboflavin, um, it's got massive amounts of all your important B vitamins and it's got a massive amount of all your fat soluble vitamins. And you mentioned vitamin A, it's got vitamin K, it's got yeah. a little bit of vitamin D or, uh, and E. And I just really want to make a, a, a point about vitamin A um, and often this idea that we should be avoiding too much vitamin A in pregnancy. And that is, that's true. But the studies that were done on the toxicity of vitamin A in pregnancy were based on uh, extracted isolated retinol that was not given in the context of real food and the safe upper limit of of, of vitamin a in pregnancy is around 10,000 um, international units and you can get that by still eating liver throughout just just don't eat a lot of it and obviously don't eat a carnivore yeah. liver don't eat yeah. don't eat polar bear liver or or, or wolf's <laughs> liver you, and you'll be fine. Yeah. So, um, and also looking at in sorry in conjunction with the supplements that you're taking, and making sure that we're constantly reviewing those supplements mm. in conjunction with your diet to make sure that the type of vitamin A and the quantity that you're getting is okay. Yeah. And I think as well, it was mainly within that first trimester, so you've got a little bit more scope within trimester two and three. Yeah. And that first trimester is where we're looking at um, being a little bit more careful. Just with the supplementation, yeah, um, with the vitamin A, definitely. And I think you know, going back to that um, whole food approach, and you talked about fat soluble vitamins. It's really like, and this is something I try and educate clients on all the time: is that you can take a supplement, but if you look at something like your vitamin A, D, E, and K, they're fat soluble. So what does that mean? It means that it requires fat to be absorbed and utilized by the body. So if you're having a low-fat diet or you're not eating nose to tail or you're not eating the whole food, you, you might be getting the nutrients, but you're not getting the part of it that's going to help you to utilize that within the body. And it's just so important. And then you take whole food and it has it within it. So if you take an avocado, it's got the vitamin E, it's got the vitamin A in it, but it also has the fat to be able to utilize those. And so when you eat real food, you can't go wrong because nature's, got your back you know it's figured it out exactly and i really want to emphasize the point that modern medicine and modern obstetric care um we're we're in a a reductionist model we're in a model of isolating specific nutrients and then using them in isolation um prescribed to treat you know prevent spina bifida or or, you know increase our Mm. but it's it misses the complexity that is the biological system of the human body. And it misses the the fact that we need iron in, say, particular iron, in a particular form, which is heme iron. We need it complexed yes. with all these other cofactors. 
um, and the absorption of these these substances is optimized miraculously in the form of real food and in the form of some foods like liver, um, like meat, yeah. like egg yolks, like oysters, um, like yeah. bone broth. Um, so, I mean, nature's done the hard work for us. Um, yeah. And and again, I, and I want to emphasize that lack of the anti-nutrients. And you mentioned um, pepitas, mm-hmm. but the, the reality is that a lot of plant foods do have toxins, phytates, oxalates, compounds that Mm -hmm. impair our body's utilization of what scant nutrient is in those plant foods relative to to the animal foods. And unless you're using a process of processing like um, sprouting or fermentation, yeah, Yeah. then then you're not really getting the most out of it. So they're not interchangeable. And I I really want to to, to emphasize that point. Mm. You mentioned a little bit about stretch marks. Can you can you talk about um, this I, stretch marks? Who who have you seen getting stretch marks? How do we pre, how do you, would can women prevent getting stretch marks throughout pregnancy and life? Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, sure. So this is actually really funny because in my first pregnancy, I got no stretch. I got a little. I got a little. Ski, I call it a little ski hump at the end of my the top of my belly button. And if you like ski down my belly, you just like ski right off. And then in my second pregnancy, I was so fearful of stretch marks. I was just, it was, it was like the worst thing that could have possibly happened was to get all these stretch marks. And during that pregnancy, I was stretched in my lifestyle. I was anxious. I was in a job that was really, really stressful and that was um, not very supportive. It was a really, really, really tough time during that pregnancy mentally and emotionally. And I, was, I felt stretched in my life. And I ended up getting stretch marks. And I think this is so, (laughs) one, that I really, really, really didn't want them, but two, that I got them. And I look back and I think, well, I was stretched in my life and I got these stretch marks, but I want to talk about that. That's like an energetic perspective and and looking at the emotional and the physical and how they interplay. But on a a nutrient perspective, when you are stressed like I was, you're depleting your nutrients like your zinc and your vitamin C. And what those nutrients do is they support collagen production, right? And what is collagen? Collagen is the new, the, the product, the uh, body product that creates elasticity within your skin and that plum vital look that we all go for. And so you can take collagen, but if you don't have the nutrients that are going to support your body's own innate ability to create it, then you're kind of just band-aiding it, if that makes sense. And so the foods that I look at with clients in terms of preventing stretch marks are, one, zinc and vitamin C, lots of fresh fresh produce. So vitamin C is a water-soluble um, vitamin, and what that means is that you require vi- uh, water to utilise the vitamin C. But what it also means is that the longer you, the further you from picking that you eat that product, the lower the vitamin C content is. So parsley is really, really rich in vitamin C, but it drops its vitamin C content by 80% after six hours of picking. So if you're consuming your parsley from the supermarket, you're not going to be getting vitamin C from there that you can utilize. So lots of fresh produce, lots of the foods that we just talked about in terms of oysters and your offal and and nutrient-dense foods like that. But then also I love this concept of it's called the doctrine of signatures. Have you heard this? No, I haven't. So yeah, explain, please. So it says that if you're wanting a particular outcome with your body, you eat that that product. So if we look at skin, you want to be looking at consuming the skin of the chicken, the skin of the animal, because that's going to have all the nutrients to support skin health and to support reducing stretch marks and that collagen and elasticity. If you look at a skin, the skin of a chicken, it contains all of that um, chondroitin and the collagen within that to to have an act on that. Same with bone health. If you're looking at improving your bone health, you want to be consuming good quality bone broth, organic bone broth, because that is has all the nutrients in there to support your bone health. So that's called the doctrine of signatures if you want to look it up, and it's absolutely fascinating. Everybody knows about walnuts are good for your brain health. It's the same thing. I mean, that, that intuitively makes sense, sense sense to me. I mean, like supports like if you, um, yeah, if you're trying to build something, you might as well use um, componentry that has 
all the precursors um, there in in a bioavailable form. Um, that I mean, that's that's fas- fascinating. And uh, um, Jenna, can you talk a little bit because we've I guess we've emphasized animal foods for the past um, mm-hmm. little while. Uh, I want you to talk a little bit about uh, women who have been vegetarian or vegan um, maybe for a decade. What do you, would you, what's your approach to, to, to someone like that? What do you try and emphasize? How do you kind of, um, yeah, what, what, what advice would you give someone like that? Mm. It's something that I always tread very consciously with and I don't ever want to put my belief systems or the way that onto people from a personal perspective. But what I do encourage with them is to tune in and ask how is this, how are they feeling within these foods? So typically um, you've got to look at the whole lifestyle. I think I've known about three really, really vibrant, healthy, plant-based people in my life, okay, in my consulting life. And I look at them and they, their parents were plant-based, vegetarian, vegans. So they were born, they were conceived that way and then they were brought up that way. So their gut microbiome is supportive of that way of eating. And if you were to give them a steak to eat, they would feel quite ill because they don't have the things like the hydrochloric acid and the enzymes to break that down. So typically if someone comes into my office and they say they're thinking about going plant-based, I always ask the question, well, why? Like, what is it that's making you do that? If eating meat was a a really healthy option for you, would you choose that option? And 95% of the time they say yes. And what it usually comes down to is that when they eat a steak, they feel really unwell. And I I encourage educating them on things like, well, you don't feel unwell because of the food. You feel unwell because your body has low hydrochloric acid not enough enzymes and your gut microbiome is all out of whack and therefore it's just getting stuck and it's um, it's sitting there and so you can't you don't have the acid to break it down so that you can utilize the nutrients and then you get flatulence and you get bloating and you get cramping and your stools are all out of whack and not consistent and that's the flow and effect of that so then what we do is we support their hydrochloric acid production pop them on some enzymes for a short period of time while their body's innate system is creating its own enzymes and over a period of time they start to really enjoy their meat and it actually doesn't take as long as you think it does but I think the tricky part here is that everybody comes to this decision with their own um, guidance system and so for me it's not about saying this way is best Um, I don't want to offend anyone I just encourage them to tune in and ask these questions how am I feeling when I eat this product is it making me feel bloated? And how can we maximize what you are eating, your nutrient capacity? Because what I typically see in my clinic is that people who are eating plant-based are eating um, fake foods. You know, they're not eating real food anyway. Um, they're often B12 and iron deficient. They're lacking in energy. They're not sleeping well. Um, they look lackluster, so like just not that um, that plump vitality within their skin and their hair and their nails and so I guess it's taking them gently on a journey of discovering how they can feel well within the paradigm of consuming foods that they're comfortable with because I understand that to go from plant-based to meat eating is a massive jump when you've got a lot of belief systems the way that we eat is not just the way that we eat it comes to from our belief systems and um all of the emotional stuff that we've experienced over our life as well. And so I'm quite considerate of that when I do have someone in front of me that's plant-based. Yeah, that's um, that's an amazing approach, very em- empathetic and, and understanding. Um, I really liked your the point that you made about the belief systems and um, the way that narratives are directed in today's day and age is very much pointing people um, towards plant-based and, and um, lack of animal food diet for a variety of reasons, um, for allegedly for for planet health, um, for animal welfare, a, a range of reasons. And there, it's very skillfully portrayed or um, expressed in a way to pull on heartstrings and, and pull on empathy, um, particularly of, um, and I think young women are particularly 
um, susceptible or, or, or empathetic in that regard. Um, my advice or my approach would be to say to someone is really examine those beliefs, um, really understand perhaps why you are, pl- are plant-based or why you think it's the best thing for yourself and the planet. And look, there's many different resources to to, to go down, but um, the, it's pretty clear that cattle and ruminant animals are not making any really con- material or, or important contribution to um, greenhouse gas emission when we compare them to to electricity generation, transport industry, and properly sourced red meat, whether that's wild caught venison or regeneratively raised beef, um, can and is humanely um, killed. And that animal lives a carefree life for its whole life until the moment you know it 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 has um, its life ended. And and I think really drilling down into these reasons and these beliefs is going to help someone make a decision that's right for them, especially if we're thinking about something that's important as health, um, not only of your health, but health of a future child. So, um, yeah, thank, thanks for share, sharing that approach. And I, and I really want to emphasize this point because I believe that a lot of people are suffering and a lot of people, yeah. women particularly, aren't thriving because they're restricting themselves to uh, a plant-based diet for um, dogmatic or, or, or uh, other reasons. Do you have any more, more restric- points on that? Yeah, yeah I think in, they're just restricting themselves in general. We've had, what, 30, 40 years of being told to eat less, watch your calorie intake, um, reduce your fat intake. That's probably the biggest thing that I come across and I think about what is it that creates hormones. And so when looking at this aspect of it, it's about understanding your macronutrients and knowing that protein, good quality protein, that can t- that is what gives your body, again, looking back at that recipe book, protein is the function and the structure of your body. So it's your hair, skin, nails, it's everything that you can see, but it's also your hormone production. It's your enzyme production. So you don't eat meat, your enzyme production drops because you don't have the nutrients to be creating the enzymes. And so you say, well, I can't I can't digest meat very well, so you drop your intake. And so it's like a chicken and the egg scenario where you're not giving you the body, the body, the ingredients that needs to produce the things to digest the food. Um, so that's the protein component. But also I love educating clients on where they're getting your amino acids from. And so when you're looking at animal product, you get all of your nine essential amino acids from the one product, from the one bite. Okay, so you've got nine essential amino acids. And what that means is you have to get them from your food. You cannot make them in the body. And I describe it in terms of like a pearl necklace. Like if you're wearing a pearl necklace and that pearl necklace represents um, a protein strand, yeah, on on a biochemical level, and then you chop that um, protein strand, the pearls are going to scatter across the floor, right? So you've got all of these amino acids just flinging around the floor, and then you grab those amino acids and you put, put the pearl necklace back together. They're going to be together but in a different order, and that's what your body does. It grabs a protein strand, the acid and the enzymes break it down, and then your body grabs the isolated amino acids to rebuild what it needs. We can give the body a food, but we can't dictate what it does with that, right? Not with what those nutrients are. So protein is the most important macronutrient from my perspective because it builds things. The second one is fats because that's what, again, it creates your hormones. It creates your immune, it helps support your immune system, your gut health. It reduces inflammation if you're consuming the right fat. Um, it improves things called satiation, feeling satisfied on an emotional and physical level. It helps to stabilize your blood sugar levels. So fat is incredibly important. And then the third macronutrient is carbohydrates. Now, carbohydrates, I like to talk about using them like smart cards. But if you did not consume carbohydrates, your body can create glucose. So carbohydrate, like from an apple, converts into the sugar molecule glucose within the body. If you did not consume any carbohydrate, your body would create glucose through a process called gluconeogenesis. And it's really important to understand because there's a lot of fear-mongering around the way that we eat. And so once you have this education on what you're eating, 
what it does within the body and how it's making you feel, you're empowered to make a choice regardless of the media narrative, regardless of the friend sitting next to you that's saying, well, I tried this diet and it really worked for me. You're able to tune in and use your own guidance system and go, does that sit well for me? Within my own belief systems and my own life experiences and then to experiment with that unjudgmentally. Yeah, no, I, lo- I love that. And to to emphasize a, a point in terms of the fat and then our body's evolved need for fat, um, cholesterol, dietary cholesterol and cholesterol that's produced in the body is necessary for all our sex hormone production. So um, y- yes, we do make some ourselves, but um, if we're thinking about this concept of surplus, micronutrient surplus, we're thinking about the full shelves at the supermarket, we want to be eating foods that are rich in cholesterol, including egg yolks, including fat, animal fat, um, including foods like liver. The, and and these, this, this cholesterol will help us build um, uh, sex hormones like estrogen, like progesterone, um, like testosterone. So an, an absolutely uh, a critical dietary component. Um, Definitely. And so I just mm, want to add to that. Yeah. Every single cell in the human body has a cholesterol receptor. Every single cell has a receptor to pull cholesterol in and utilize it. And I think that in itself just shows you how integral and so, and important it is for the human body. Yeah. Yeah. No, you, you're 100% right. Cholesterol. The molecule is a component in all our cell membranes. And yes, as you said, every cell has a receptor to, to pull in lipoproteins that contain and, and transport cholesterol. So um, yeah, that, that is, is absolutely essential. Um, we, we, we're just about coming up on, on an hour and this has been such an amazing discussion, Jenna. I really, really appreciate your um, your perspectives. Do you have any, I guess, closing thoughts just to tie up this topic of pre-pregnancy preparation? Um, anything specifically that we missed or you really want to emphasize? Yeah, I think it's this term, this like concept of having space within your life. And um, I know a lot of people who are trying to conceive and I we talk about their lives and how full they are. And so if you want to hold a baby and be able to have a baby within your life, you need to look at how stressed are you? Is there space for that baby? And um, and brain space and how much do you know about yourself? How much do you trust your intuition and really nurture that educational component about your body, about pre-pregnancy, about pregnancy and about birth because when you stand up and you hold your own and you say this is the way that I want to do it, often will be challenged and I have experienced this but I think that cultivating that trust in the human body and asking yourself first, how does this sit true for me with regards to diet, with regards to testing, with regards to supplementation and medications and all of the things that come into play when you have a baby and you're wanting to get pregnant is going to support you long term because you're the one that's got to do this. And I think, again, going back to that fear mongering, being pre-pregnant, pregnancy, there is so much fear. There is just so much fear pushed onto us as women that we can steer away from having trust within our human body and what it's capable of. And I really just want to impress upon women and everybody that your body was made for this. Like you were born to be pregnant and birth a baby. That is literally what the female human body is designed to do. So nurture that encourage that surround yourself with people who are going to support you through this time and reach out and get and get help and support from a practitioner that you trust and people that you trust so that you have that network of support as you move through this time because it in no other phase of life does, is it that other people feel that they can have an opinion on your body and really looking into an understanding informed consent around absolutely everything to do with your body, testing and birth and holding true to what you want and what you believe to um, be the most supportive and nourishing for you and your bubble. 
uh, I love it. Beautifully said. Um, trust yourself. Trust your intuition. So um, that's fantastic. So Jenna, can you give the listeners a bit of an idea of how they can get in touch with you or connect with you or start working with you? I would love that. So they can head to jennapool.com and that's where you can find recipes and my blog posts and bookings. Um, and you can also find me on Jenna's Nourishing Life on Instagram and Facebook and that's probably where I am at daily with stories and tidbits. Yeah, and, and you take clients all across Australia, all across the world. Is that correct? All across the world. It's so cool. Yeah, I've got clients all across the world, particularly in Bahrain, some in England, um, and mostly in Melbourne as well. So I do video telehealth consults and in-person consults. All right. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for um, coming on and sharing your experience and perspectives with um, with everyone. It's Yeah, it's been great. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun. All right. We'll talk again. Okay, happy day. See ya. What did you guys think of that? I really enjoyed this conversation with Jenna, whose perspectives on diet, nutrition, and pre-pregnancy preparation I thought were just so valuable and so practical. And obviously from her perspective of treating patients as well as going through um, three of her own pregnancies. Um, I really, really liked her concept of the micronutrient power bank. And I think that's a very, very powerful way of thinking about this concept. Um, of making sure that you've got everything you need um, before you fall pregnant. And there will be in more guests on this topic. I, I really think there's a lot to be said. Um, so stay tuned. Um, if you haven't subscribed, or um, please do so. And please share this podcast um, with anyone who you think may benefit. So thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you again soon.